everyone welcome back to under the lemon tree i'm rain and today i'm here with my friend ryan he's an expert on all things medieval and we're just gonna have a lot of fun today talking about the real world medieval influences behind um house the dragon so thank you so much for joining You're me welcome. today ryan and i'm a medieval fan mm. which in today's jargon means yes i am an expert yes <laughs> because i've read a few books <laughs> well you know you know more than than me or anyone else i know so yeah. i would consider you an expert uh first thing i want to ask you is how long have you been a fan of game of thrones house of the dragon the whole a song of fire universe so i got in right under the bar for hipster <laughs> in that i read the books uh, I read the first book of uh, A Game of Thrones in 2011, right when the show was coming out. Mm -hmm. And so I was hearing the buzz, and I had already bought the book months earlier, oh. maybe even a year earlier, just on a whim on Amazon, because really? I'm not good with money. <laughs> and it had a cool title, and it kind of had a good description, and then it kind of gained dust on my uh, reading list. And uh, my writing mentor at the time was like, oh, you need to watch this. You would love it. And I'd always been a fantasy fan since Lord of the Rings, and um, I loved history, um, but I wasn't as into it as I am now, and a big reason for that is Game of Thrones, because Game of Thrones um, delves so much into this fictional history that is inspired from real history, and so I was kind of a junkie at that point. I read all the books, uh, I loved the show, and... And at that time, there wasn't Fire and Blood, there wasn't The World of uh, Ice and Fire, mm -hmm. and I don't really reread books, so the only way to get my fix was to read actual historical fiction and medieval history. Yeah. So that's how I got into it. And what I love so much about medieval history and Game of Thrones is that it's epic and political, but it's so intensely personal. Mm -hmm. And you get those great what-if moments. Um... So yeah, that's what I really love about it. Absolutely, and I love that you bring that up because I know George R. R. Martin has said that at at their core, his stories are about the human heart and conflict with himself, with itself. So it seems like even the author as well is very interested in the the personal conflicts that we see in these fantasy, you know, political conflicts. Yeah, and our modern politics, there are a lot of families and personalities involved. You got the Kennedys. Clintons, the Bushes, the Trump family now, mm -hmm. but they're, they're still a nation. If Biden goes away, America doesn't stop existing. Mm -hmm. But in a real sense, if uh, the King of England back in the Middle Ages goes asleep, the English government shuts down. Wow. Um, because the nation is so wrapped up in this one individual and in these families. So... Um, so yeah, that's what makes it so fascinating, and we've talked about this before, but there's mm -hmm. that moment where, um, oh, what is it, Arya is fighting with Joffrey mm -hmm. in season one, Yeah, and it's like this awkward kids fight mm -hmm. that escalates into violence. Kind of like in House of the Dragon when all the kids fight in it, that cave. Yeah, like <laughs> yeah. when the, all the kids fight in that cave. And then that escalates further into a geopolitical crisis mm -hmm. that has to be handled. And that's what I love is that you have these grudges or you have these passions. Absolutely. And they just explode. Absolutely. And I love that you bring that up because that's something I like a lot about House of the Dragons. That yes, it is a political conflict. It's a succession war. But it seems like the fuel behind it is these very personal things. Like we follow this very personal relationship between Alicent and Rhaenyra and how the way their friendship dissolves has implications for how they treat their children and how their children feel about each other. And they're kind of stoking the fire of war and how... Um, Gosh, I don't remember who said this. It was I, I watch a lot of like Game of Thrones YouTubers, mm -hmm. you know, who analyze House Dragon and all that. And I, I forgot who said this, but one of them said something about like, it's so interesting that in this world, like who's friends with who and who's sleeping with who is a matter of national like security and political prominence, which is strange how the interpersonal yet yeah, affects the political. Yeah, like what's what what's that uh, Kingsguard name, Nicole? Oh, Kristen Cole. Kristen Cole. Oh yeah. How. <laughs> 
uh, he sleeps with Rhaenyra, so you think, oh, well, he's going to be on Rhaenyra's side mm -hmm. in this conflict, but no. Mm -hmm. So, um, and is it is it hinted that he's sleeping with, um, is it Allison? Yeah, it, that's a theory. Some people think they are together, and I, I personally think there were some hints that there was something going on there, because Allison... I forgot what episode turned him was like she was like remember your affection for me as your queen and i'm like oh like mm -hmm. which is interesting because that would just double down on allison's hypocrisy right like she thinks rhaenyra is you know unruly or whatever for sleeping around but if she's also sleeping with Kristen, like was that yeah i her? imagine you know in my own head canon that it's like they had a fling for a few years mm. and then it stops mm. after a while because so much time passes in between episodes um, I mean, come on, <laughs> you know, look at him. He's beautiful. He's, he's pretty, beautiful. Be and, uh, and he's the only one who doesn't change. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's <laughs> not recasted. Decades. It's weird seeing Rainer and Allison played by different people, but then Kristen's like the same age. I'm like, what? <laughs> I, I wonder if that's because they just liked that actor. Because it could some, be that. a lot of shows, they'll write more material for an actor when they, the whole, the cast, the crew, the audience falls in love with them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I wonder if that's the reason. But Yeah, that could be a reason. I think it could also be because, I mean, I don't know exactly how old Kristen was when we first meet him at the beginning of the season, but it's, I get the impression he's already an adult while Rhaenyra is like a teenager. And I realize they, they recast the actors when they go from like childhood to adulthood. So maybe because Kristen yeah. was already an adult, they didn't recast them the same way they don't recast, you know, Otto or Viserys or Harold Westerling or the other adults. So I wonder if that's yeah. part of it, too. Because I guess mm. um, Rhaenyra is supposed to be a few years younger than Kristen yeah. Cole. Yeah, she was only like 15 at the beginning. Okay. So, yeah, I wonder how old he was. I don't know. Um, well, kind of going along with that, who would you say is your favorite character in the Song of Ice and Fire universe and why? Oh, the Song of Ice and Fire universe? Or in House of the Dragon. No, uh, whichever you... I'll... I always love Tywin Lannister. Um... Mm -hmm. There is that, um, sorry about the names, it's been a while since oh, it's okay. come up, uh, reviewed that stuff. Oh, it's no worries. Uh, it's not, who's the guy who comes after Joffrey? Oh, um, Tommen. Tommen. When Tommen was giving, like, a crash course in how to be a badass by Tywin, <laughs> yeah. I was so envious of Tommen. <laughs> and because he just, he's evil, but he's so competent. And mm -hmm. I think that's so interesting. And, it, you know, there's a lot of memes of, like, ty showing Tywin. It's, like, that moment, that awkward moment when you start rooting for the villain. Yeah. Because he's yeah. such the villain, but you you see, you know, Ramsay Bolton or you see Cersei and you're just like, oh, yuck. Like, mm -hmm. come on. And Tywin is, like, the rock exactly. of everything. And when Joffrey is, like, give, you know, throwing stuff at his face and Tywin's just, you just know. Mm-hmm how what an imbalance this is absolutely but uh in house of the dragon uh it's viserys mm -hmm. and i didn't like him at first me neither <laughs> he, he, in his first scene he's like awkward and i was like oh so he's an idiot i, I don't i didn't really care but he has so many shades to him mm -hmm. in that he he loves his family um he's a, he's headstrong and uh, he get he butts heads with Rhaenyra. Yeah. But he never betrays her, according to some people in the show. Mm -hmm. He never betrays her. Yeah. And, but also I love the the vulnerability of, as he's getting older, he can't undo the mistakes that he made. Mm -hmm. That these are problems that should have been fixed, really decades ago. Yeah. And that, you know, him at the dinner table saying, love each other. It's like, it's, it's a too bit late. too late. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I love Viserys. Who's your favorite character? Oh, that's hard to say. Uh, I definitely agree with a lot of what you had to say about Viserys. At the beginning, I really didn't like him. But the reason for that was I could not forgive him for murdering Emma. I mean, that's how I saw it, was that he murdered um, his wife to save his son, who died anyway. And I just saw that as like a horrible very misogynistic decision. I feel like his misogyny just continued to show through, like, even when Damon was, like, 
listen, Viserys, you and I slept around and did whatever, and Rhaenyra is the same thing, why do you care? And he's like, because she's a, she's a girl. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, oh, he's forwarding these misogynistic ideals, and I just cannot stand that. But um, I think throughout the season, I became very endeared to him again because of his love for family, like you were saying, and his just undying devotion to Rhaenyra as his daughter and his, like, constant concern for her well-being, like, really made me feel that he had this this deep love as a father and I think that that made me start to really love Viserys and the fact that he understood the weight and the gravity of what he did to Emma because that was like my main gripe with mm. him the fact that he lived with that guilt for the rest of his life yeah again helped me sympathize with him more because I'm like okay he understands the gravity of what he's done you know and he feels remorse for it and yeah so I started to forgive him I would say more and more and yeah I think Patty Considine just gave such an incredible heart-wrenching performance even george r, r. martin yeah. said like you gave this character like a tragic majesty that i didn't that he didn't in fire and blood so um my favorite character oh um i love rainera i i just see her as like this feminist icon just this queen <laughs> um i was rainier for halloween as you know oh yeah um yeah i just um i don't know so much in the book because i haven't read fire and blood and from what i understand it's it's a little bit different in the book but i see rainier as kind of a trailblazer for wanting to change these misogynistic ideals that have stifled her throughout her life you know even the way in the season finale she invites bela and reyna to the painted table and like wants them to have a say in these political negotiations which is something that her father never allowed her to do even after she was named heir she was still the cupbearer and Whereas, you know uh, reyna kind of accepts what the world is. Mm. Whereas Rhaenyra really is not willing to accept it. Exactly. And I, I like that a lot. I like the fact that she's saying, like, no, like, I'm the rightful heir. I'm the firstborn. Viserys named me the heir. This is my right. And I feel like anyone trying to deny that is doing it for sexist reasons. It's like they only don't want her on the crown, on the throne because she's a woman. Mm. And so I appreciate the kind of the, the feminist fight I see in her. Um... So I think that's the thing I really like about her. Um, uh, let me see. So, you know, we were kind of talking about the um, the real historical influences behind the show. Mm -hmm. uh, why do you think it's important for us to, like, kind of investigate and understand the real stories that inspired these fictional ones? Oh, God, that caught me, caught me off guard because to me it's just so much fun. Yeah, it's um, interesting. I mean, that's a reason. It's yeah. like, yeah, it's uh, it's like the first draft. Uh, it's like seeing the origins of something. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's important to know that the events shown in this TV series are not that far-fetched mm -hmm. and that these things really did happen. And then we can really appreciate how they're happening in real life personally and, you know, in politics today. Like, all mm -hmm. the politics is still human. Absolutely. And um, and also because it it shows a great uh, contrast, you start to see like what what I really noticed is that uh, with Game of Thrones, you know, you have the original history, and it's muddied by reality mm -hmm. because real people it takes forever to travel to places. People get you know the pox, mm -hmm. and they, you know they're just like uh, they get sick or whatever. Um, and then George R. R. Martin takes that and amps it up to 10, mm -hmm. and then the show will take what he wrote and amp it up to 11. Yeah. And, but it is, uh, cool to me to find out what the origin is and how it informs or is a contrast to what the show does. And it kind of can show us who we are as a society and what our cultural tastes are and our mm -hmm. values are by seeing the contrast. Absolutely. No, I like that you bring that up a lot. I think that's a great point. And I like that you bring up how, um, you know, shows like this can have implications as far as politics today and the world today. Because that's something I talk a lot about in my podcast, how, you know, there are messages of uh, female bodily autonomy in this show. There's messages of just patriarchal systems in general, um, sexual liberation, um, you know, Me Too. Um, well, I've even heard conversations yeah. relating to the Russian invasion of Ukraine happening in this show with regards to if we 
consider the dragons to be nuclear weapons. Yes. Um, so I like that you bring that up because that's something I definitely see a lot in the show and that I focus on in, in, in my analysis of my podcast is how even though this takes place in a fantasy medieval world and is a fictional story, like it has so much to say about our modern real world, I think. And mm-hmm. like you said, it's not so far-fetched because it's based on real things that happened and it's also speaking to things that are happening today. Yeah, one quick example is mm-hmm. I read a book on uh, King Edward the Third, mm-hmm. who is outside of our discussion uh, <laughs> for today. But what's fascinating is that in his early years, he was in the middle of a like a divorce between Queen Isabella and King Edward the Second. Okay. And and in this history book, you're they're reciting the letters that were sent to Edward, and that mm-hmm. Edward had to send back, and it's a messy divorce, mm-hmm. where each parent is guilting him to either come or stay, mm-hmm. and I'm just thinking, oh my god, this would be a great story for kids struggling with that today, mm-hmm. and because you, part of storytelling is seeing something that you're familiar with, but in, but larger than life, absolutely, hyper real almost, mm-hmm. and so then that I don't know the mechanics of it, but that's very integral to how we experience stories and how we understand things. It gives gives us gives us another perspective. Absolutely. You know. For sure. Because uh, you know, a, a boy in twenty twenty two who has to negotiate those waters, you're that boy is pretty much in a diplomatic conundrum mm-hmm. between these two parents. Yeah. But we don't call it that because it's every day it's mundane. Mm-hmm. So but yeah, oh. that's, that's a great example. I yeah, think. that is a great example to show that conflicts like that, like divorce and families falling apart, are, are kind of timeless in that way. Yeah. Well, awesome. Well, I'd love to get into now the the real historical influences behind House of the Dragon and what you, what you want to share with me today. Yeah, so the main skeletal structure of the show in terms of historical inspiration is the anarchy. Mm-hmm. And the anarchy, just to, it was a 18 year long civil war mm-hmm. in England. And just to give, it happened between 1138 and 1153. Mm-hmm. And just to give some perspective of what that means, just not to just throw numbers at you, mm-hmm. uh, this is about 39 years after um, the First Crusade. Okay. It is before Richard the Lionheart and King John, and it is way before the War of the Roses and the Tudors and mm-hmm. Henry VIII. That inspired Game so of Thrones. So this yeah. period of medieval history is fascinating because we're taking our baby steps out of the Dark Ages. Okay. So only a few generations back you had Vikings, and French Vikings which are the scariest of all. <laughs> um, and And so... You're dealing with um, with Game of Thrones and House of the Dragon. What you're really seeing on screen is uh, late medieval Renaissance stuff. So no one in this time period of the anarchy has plate mail. They don't have these big bulky pieces of armor mm-hmm. or these massive armies or huge castles. It was much, it was really a dark, it was kind of the backwater of Europe and of Eurasia. So really? at, at the same time, um, Islam is going through its golden age. Mm. And I think like Baghdad has like a million people. I'm, I'm making that up. I don't know. But yeah. the, these, like the Islamic world is like amazing. And over in England, we're fighting with sticks. You know, mm. that's kind of an idea of what's going on. That's fascinating. Like very disparate technological um, development, which is kind of interesting because I feel like that's kind of reverse of what we see in the Song of Ice and Fire world, it seems like Westeros, which is kind of modeled off of Europe, seems to be one of the most developed places, but it seems like a lot of the rest of the world, Essos, perhaps used to be advanced, but then fell, like Valyria. Yeah, example. I was thinking, I was actually thinking about that the other day. Mm-hmm. It would, it, it would make sense because we have these seasons that last for years. Yeah. But also, you had dragons, which are nuclear weapons, and the Valyrians yeah. were not shy about using them. Yeah. And then you have the Doom of Valyria. Yeah. So it would be, it'd be like dropping a nuclear bomb on Periclean Athens. Mm. 
you know, Socrates, boom, gone. Yeah. And there's actually uh, a moment in Islamic history where the Mongols sack Baghdad. Okay. And that, that was like a nuclear bomb going off. Mm-hmm. Like, it, they had the, the House of Wisdom. Mm. Amazing f- philosophical center, just amazing. All gets wiped out by the Mongols. Wow. And it's sort of like, if that would have... It's one of the explanations, you can take it or leave it, mm-hmm. of why Islam, the Islamic world started to lag behind Europe. Mm. You know, but that's... Yeah. that's I, I'm, I'm trying to, like, control myself because these tangents... Spread, and spread no it's and okay so, i'm i'm um, I'm happy to follow follow you on any tangent but that that is kind of interesting that we see that modeled in the song of ice and fire world as well like a society that was once perhaps more advanced than the rest of the world like valyria or mm-hmm. like the islamic world that you're saying some you know tragedy happened that all of a sudden set them back so that all of a sudden europe and westeros are yeah. more advanced yeah i'll get into this later but yeah the, the rest of the, valyria is very kind of it's obviously on the surface based on Roman Empire, mm-hmm. but there's a lot more parallels to Egypt. Interesting. And so okay. by the time of the Romans and definitely by the time of the medieval world, mm-hmm. uh, Egypt was really a subject people. It was mm-hmm. a massive grain factory, mm-hmm. uh, but Egypt would not be independent till the last century. Yeah. So uh, definitely a lot of lost glory going on. Absolutely. But... Um, so the anarchy uh, starts off with, it's set up, I should say, by Henry I of England, mm-hmm. who is our Viserys. Mm-hmm. He was a great lawgiver and administrator that enjoyed a long reign of peace and prosperity. And Henry, unlike Viserys, was quite formidable, even a bit cruel. Okay. Um, but he brought English administration and government to new heights. And something to consider about this time period, like how it's kind of a backwater, it's still like very tribal and very uh, violence was associated with the high class, not the low class. Mm. So you get gangs and bandits and, you know, you always have that. But unlike today in the modern world, the biggest source of concern for a peasant was a lord and his gang of ruffians interesting as they would go raid and pillage so that henry was able to like end that Mm -hmm. because of how strong he was so in the medieval world it's like you would rather have a cruel king that kept you know that knocked heads and kept people in line Mm -hmm. than a nice king who let things slide okay so that's what henry the first was and he ruled for like 35 years Wow. Which is a long, long time. And he's struggled at producing an heir to his kingdom as well. Mm. Even though, hilariously, he fathered something like 20 Ill- illegitimate children. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and, uh, but very, and, but he did have one son, um, William Etheling. And mm-hmm. Etheling is a nickname for the crown prince. Mm. Okay. And that's something we're going to go through with all the awesome names. Oh, yay. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he had William. Um, and, uh, but, and William was uh, 17 when he died, though. Wow. So that's what creates. So in the show, you have uh, Emma. Mm-hmm. Is it Emma? I think they just say Emma. Maybe Emma. They say yeah, they, they have Emma. In this, it's... Uh, William, who dies at 17. Okay. And William was an arrogant and pampered prince, mm-hmm. as you do. Yeah, of course. But he was also a noble and admirable man. He was turning out to be a great prince. And mm-hmm. that he knew what to do. He was being trained by his father. Mm-hmm. He was becoming co-ruler. Co- wow. Co-king. Which wow. was a practice back then. Mm-hmm. And he was a duke. And he was getting married. Oh, at seven, you know, at seventeen. Yeah, he's doing all the good things he's supposed to do. And then there's something called the White Ship Disaster. Okay. Uh, they are traveling back to England over the English Channel. Henry the First goes on the um, first vessel, mm-hmm. and William travels behind with his entourage. Mm-hmm. Above are like two hundred people. Oh my, that's a lot of people. And they're <laughs> drinking. Of course. And they're having such a good time on the, sh- the boat in the harbor that they just keep drinking and just, ah, let's just pass the time. Oh, no. And the crew gets drunk. 
Oh, it's like a Titanic situation now. Very isn't it? much. <laughs> so imagine if the um, the royal fam the English royal family was on the British royal family, I should say, mm -hmm. was on the Titanic. Oh God. And um, the crew and the captain are even boasting that even though the king's ship had left first, their ship was fast enough to beat them to England. And um, uh, it's pitch black when they set off. And the ship hits a rock uh, that punctures the hull. Of course. Uh, freezing salt water rushed in as desperate crew and passengers tried to bail out the water, all amid the screams and shouts crying out in the pitch black of night. It's oh, terrifying. So, and um, people were hurled, had been hurled overboard uh, from the jolt of the impact. And also remember, this is November. Oh, so this it's is really frigid. Freezing. Um, and people struggled to tread water with their richly designed clothing. Mm. It just, once it gets wet, it's a weight on you. Terrible. Uh, There's some beautiful irony there. Like, they're, yes. like they're hubris, they're wealth. They're wealth, killed yeah. Them. Uh, the first thought was to save William. Of course. And a lifeboat was put over the side, and William was, and a few others got in and rowed away. Mm -hmm. However, William heard the screams of his half-sister half Matilda, oh. uh, who's a bit older than him. And he could not bear leaving her. Oh. So he ordered the lifeboat to turn around and rescue her. A tragic, this is a tragic thing. Because other people were suffering around Matilda. Mm. They all rush the lifeboat, capsize it, and William was cast into the water to die along with all but one of the passengers and crew. Oh, so he died trying to save his sister then. He died trying to save oh. his sister. Yeah. Wow. So it sounds like they had a good relationship then, that, that they, they loved yeah. each other. Yeah, and this entourage of like 200 people, remember Henry has like 20 illegitimate children. Yeah. A lot of these are half-siblings, cousins, big. And something else is that this was uh, sort of the the young Kennedy. Mm -hmm. Or um, Kennedy's um, JFK's son, Jeff, uh, yeah. uh, John John, yeah. um, his nickname was. Uh, dying and that these were up and comers. Th this was going to be like the next generation mm -hmm. of uh, royalty and lords. Yeah. And they all just perish. Wow. And so now there's no son. Mm. And one thing that happens as well is that Henry, who of course is devastated by this, they actually send a little kid to inform him. Because oh. everyone else is terrified. And it's something like Henry collapses on the floor. Mm. And they say in the Chronicles he never smiled again. Wow. Like he really loved his son. I mean, that's much like Viserys after his wife and his son, which I think he named Balon after his father. Yeah, he was the same. He, he said he never really felt the same after that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so um, his first wife, this is something I forgot to mention, mm -hmm. but his first wife died, like Emma, oh. and then he married a new mild teenager, not my words, but... Oh, uh, like Allison. Like Allison, <laughs> but unlike the show, mm -hmm. Henry is not able to have a child with his new wife. Okay. So, um, so he's, he's trying. He's trying really hard to produce an heir, but nothing's working. Mm-hmm. And so now uh, we have the succession crisis. And one thing to remember or to know, you want to remember, sorry. <laughs> uh, something to know, uh, I just learned that this the other day. Yeah, so yeah. Gonna, um, is that kingship in this time period was much more elective than it would be later on. Really? How so? So the custom was that the, the father's firstborn son would inherit. Mm -hmm. But that was not as strict as it is shown in Game of Thrones. Okay. In that the the king could decide, you know what, I want my third son to inherit. Really? And, of course, the first son would be furious. He's going to get some pushback. Um, but it wasn't unheard of. And also, the barons and the lords, they didn't have veto power, but they could grumble. Mm -hmm. And they could kind of, you you needed a lot of times how kingship works is that the king mano y mano can take on anyone mm -hmm. with his army, but if all the if all the lords gang up on him, mm -hmm. he's toast. 
Okay. So, um, that's interesting. That's often how things went down. So there really, w- it, so meaning that this really was an open question of who's going to be the successor. Cause it could be kind of anyone. It, it could like. be anyone. Yeah. And there were a lot of names thrown around. Um, but, uh, he gives, he proclaims his daughter, Matilda, uh, his heir, um, in we have our Rhaenyra, everybody. 1127. So this is about two years after the white ship crisis. Okay. He, you know, Henry's trying to produce an heir. Nothing's working. So he announces Matilda uh, to be his heir. She was 25 at the time. Okay. She was 18 at the time of the white ship disaster. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Henry would not die for another 10 years. Wow. He lived a pretty long time then for that He lived time. a very long time. Wow. And... Uh, let's talk about Matilda for a second. Yeah. So, she is known as the Empress Matilda mm-hmm. because uh, she was sent off at eight years old to Germany to marry Henry V, Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. Oh, okay. Um, and she was surrounded by the peak, the absolute peak of high society, mm-hmm. um, going from all these imperial capitals, and she would she would even be an imperial regent. In Italy, so whenever her husband was away, she would be governing parts of his empire. Okay. Like, in his name. So she already had a lot of power. Then. She had a lot of power, and she was not a she was a, she was formidable, you know. Absolutely. Um, we'll get into her personality later, which yeah. has some flaws. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and um, and she had been living in Germany as the Empress for a decade. Wow. At this point. Um. They had no air between them. And when she was 20, 23, the German emperor died and the crown passed on to someone else. Hmm. Uh, so not to her then, they still did. Not to her. Okay. Um, if, because Germany was even more elective, mm. where they actually had votes. Really? Yeah, among the lords. Don't, don't let those mm-hmm. peasants vote. <laughs> but it was, you know, um, uh, so... So yeah, so then she's immediately recalled to, to Normandy by her father. Mm-hmm. Uh, Normandy being the seat of power for the English kings at this time period. Mm-hmm. And then one year later, she's uh, proclaimed at Christmas in 1127 uh, to be the heir. Yeah. Um, she's married off to Geoffrey of Anjou, who's an amazing character. His He's a roguish Han Solo type guy. Oh. He okay. was 15 when oh, he married her. Interesting. And she was 20, uh, uh, 25. Oh, wow. Um, Ew. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but Jeffrey turned out to be a very charming, handsome guy, but also quick to anger. He mm-hmm. pissed off a lot of people. He pissed off as many people as he endeared to him. Mm, kind of Damon like. Kind of, yeah, kind of Damon like. He had like boundless energy and was a very competent commander. And political schemer. Okay. And uh, the French viewed the Angevins, who he's a part of, as like uncouth barbarians and vicious bastards. Mm. And uh, the House of Anjou was said to have been born from the demon Melusine. We, we had yeah. a class together where that we talked about that. Yeah. Um, and that explained their quick temper. And it, uh, Jeffrey's father, Folk, becomes the king of Jerusalem. So he just departs, goes yeah. off to Jerusalem to become king. And then his grandfather, just to just to highlight how kind of dark and twisted this family is, mm-hmm. his grandfather was famous across Europe for being a real monster. Okay. You know, he killed his wife in her wedding dress, burned her at the stake because she apparently slept with some shepherd or something like that. Oh, wow. And, yeah, he was a real monster. So, Mm -hmm. Jeffrey definitely is, like, kind of the bad boy. Um, But he's not as bad as his grandfather. Mm -hmm. Um, And um, he actually comes up with the word Plantagenet. Mm, Which becomes the new, like, last name of, like, the That becomes the Targaryens. Yeah, there we go. It becomes their last name. And what it is is that he would... Uh, have he had this habit of wearing um, flowers in his hair, mm. and the flowers were Plantagenetta. Oh. So a lot of these names, like the you know the Capets or the oh God did I pronounce that right? I'm gonna be so embarrassed. 
Oh, it's okay. I find out. The, the Plantagenets or the Romanovs, a lot of these last names are jokes. Oh. Or in-jokes or, jar, you know, little things. That's kind of fascinating. Yeah. And, you know, not to, not to disrupt you from your point, but it's interesting talking about him being, you know, quick to anger and all these things and how they had these legends of where the, the, the Anjus came from. Um, that definitely reminds me of what they say about the Targaryens in Game of Thrones. They say, you know, flip a, the gods flip a coin when a Targaryen's yeah. born to see if they'll be mad or sane. And the idea that Targaryens have, like, dragon's blood and fire in their veins and that it makes them hot-tempered. I see yeah. the influences here. Yeah. So that's oh, yeah, that's a great point. Interesting. Um, so that's Matilda and Geoffrey, mm-hmm. and they have a son named Henry. Mm-hmm. who's going to be the future king. But mm-hmm. that's interrupted by another guy who's great, mm-hmm. uh, Stephen. Stephen okay. of Blois. All right. And that's something else with this story is that this is very English and French. Um, the French king at this time period was very weak compared to the English king. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of these Dutch uh, duchies and counties really were important players in France. Um, and Stephen is Matilda's cousin. Okay. And his name was thrown around in discussions of the succession. Mm. And I, I made sure to type this in all caps because I was <laughs> stunned by this. Yeah. Stephen was supposed to be on the white ship. Oh, so he would have died on he the... He would have died. Why wasn't he there? He had a stomach ache oh. and he later said he had diarrhea. Oh, wow. So he waited for the next vessel. Oh, wow. But there are these moments in Game of Thrones, like when um, Rhaenys is about, you know, has the dragon in front of the whole Alicent side of the family. Yeah, she could have killed all of them. Of, like, these great what-ifs. Mm-hmm. This is that same what-if. Yeah. What if Steven had been on that ship? Yeah. And, oh. oh, my God. Can you imagine the survivor's guilt? Oh, yeah. From that? That's fascinating. Um, so, who is Stephen? Um, he was a genuinely nice guy. Mm-hmm. And you can't really say that for a lot of medieval people yeah. or a lot of politicians of today and yeah. CEOs of today. Mm-hmm. He was a genuinely nice guy, very courteous, kind of a heart of gold. Heart of gold. Mm-hmm. But that did not win him any favors in the violent era of history that this is. Um, what... What he did is that right when Henry I died, he rushes off to London and he um, talks to the king on his deathbed. Mm-hmm. And then he comes out and says, Oh, he changed it after 10 years. Here we go. He changed his mind. <sighs> That's he, just like Allison saying that Viserys changed his mind on his deathbed. Yeah. And mm. the English noblemen were so willing. To throw Matilda and the idea of a fe- of a queen yeah. in front of the bus, that they pretty much all sided with Stephen. Just like that. So do you think it was definitely a gender thing, and or do you think it also do you think their personalities played a part in it too? Since it sounds like Stephen was a likable dude and Matilda might not have been as much, or do you think it was more of a gender thing or both? I think it was primarily a gender thing, and yeah. then the person, as you said, the personalities are going to inform what happens next. Yeah. Um, I think. At least in English history, there weren't many examples of, of uh, uh, female rulers. You had to go back to, like, Boudicca. Mm-hmm. And you would have a regent, so uh, a king would be would die and leave his son, who is a little child. Yeah. And the mother would kind of rule things. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's not the same. Yeah. And, and so it was definitely a, a very gendered thing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, these, these guys vowed... Three times, in th- <laughs> on three separate occasions, to honor Henry's decision. <sighs> and so immediately, th- at the outset of the Civil War, everyone is, um, you know, trying to be a liar. Mm-hmm. So that just sets the tone, which I, I imagine Absolutely. will be in season two. Yeah, and we definitely where... get a sense, we start to see that where Rhaenyra says, when she has that confrontation with Otto on the bridge, and she says, you know, all these lords start totally they swore to me and Otto's like, well, that was a long time ago. It doesn't really matter anymore. Which was surprising for me to hear because oaths in this world are kind of sacred. It seems like breaking an oath is a big deal. And see, you know, Otto has a real stick up his butt. So you'd imagine (laughs) that he would really be a stickler for oaths, but it's the advantages to his family. 
Yeah. So he's willing to look that aside. So mm -hmm. it's going to be interesting in season two now that everybody basically has been shown to be a traitor. Absolutely. And a liar. Absolutely. How that will set the tone for the future events. For sure. Um, and a reason why Matilda wasn't there is because she was pregnant with Henry. Oh, okay. No, I think she was pregnant with William, the second son. Mm -hmm. But she was pregnant. Mm -hmm. She couldn't go fast. So speed is an important thing in these maneuverings because mm -hmm. it's so personal. Absolutely. You have to physically be there. You can't just send a note. Absolutely. We see that when Viserys dies, dude. The second it happens, the Greens lock down the Red Keep. Like, yes. they are moving fast. They want to do everything they can to get Aegon on the throne before Rhaenyra even knows her father's dead. And there's another what if of what if um, Rhaenyra had stayed in the Red Keep. Because, mm. yeah, she was planning on coming back. She said that she was yeah. going to come back on Dragon back, and she never had the chance to. Yeah. That would be an interesting what if, yeah. That's an interesting, you know, like, what happens then? Yeah, I wonder if they would have killed her, made her bend the knee, imprisoned her. I don't know. Like, that's that's a good what if, I like. But, uh, and so, Matilda really has no supporters at this point, And three years go by. Mm -hmm. So the, the Civil War doesn't really start immediately. Yeah. There's been this coup. Um, but what happens is that even though Stephen is a nice guy, um, he's not as, uh, politically savvy as his uncle, the last king. Mm -hmm. He, and he ends up alienating everybody. Okay. He makes an oath. They always have the kings make an oath to the church, to not to mess with the priests. Okay. And he immediately, like, he eventually, like, arrests two priests. I don't know why. Oh, not that, a good look. That pisses them off. Yeah. And it, a lot of it is, like, petty nonsense. But it still matters of, like, a king's job is to, have, you know, hand out the loot, the treasure. Uh, but he would only do it for certain people. So it just, it was a death by a thousand cuts. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't as cruel and as ru politically ruthless as he needed to be mm -hmm. to handle these warlords. Okay, yeah. You know, this is a rough and tumble time. Yeah. And he ends up alienating everybody. And it's finally with uh, uh, Robert of Gloucester, who's Matilda's half-sister. So he's one of the bastard sons. Oh, okay. And he's a very powerful dude, and he sides with Matilda, and that's when the war's on. Good. After three years. And this war has some pretty fat, awesome moments, mm -hmm. but I know, I looked it up last night. Yeah. The Dance of Dragons lasts like three years. Oh, it's short. Oh, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. And... Because I think it has to be. Yeah, because there's so many dragons, everyone's going to die pretty quick. Everything's going to happen pretty quick. Right? And also, the reason why the anarchy is not as sexy as the Tudors or, you know, Henry V or all these, like, cool guys later on mm -hmm. is it's very boring. Mm. This is a war of attrition, sieges, and constant flip-flopping mm. where neither side is strong enough. They're strong enough to keep fighting. But they're not strong enough to win. Okay. So it just makes and, it kind of drag on, it sounds and like. And what is described over these 18 years, and it's this great quote that it was said that it was as if Christ and his saints had slept. Hmm. Because what starts happening is that since you have two monarchs, who decides on law? Law and order. Yeah. So what happens is that the law breaks down, and so now these warlords, these noblemen, go rogue. They just say, I'm going to build this castle over here. I'm going, and if I abuse you, mm. you can't do that. I have my castle. Okay, so they start making decisions that normally they would need, like, the king's permission to yes. do. Because they technically don't have one, or they have two, or they... Yeah, yeah. So okay. a lot of bad actors are le are let off the leash because of this. And the dynamics of civil wars is that... Um, you know, one is that uh, deals have to be made. Mm -hmm. The the lords can always say, you know, if you don't make me happy, I'm going to join the other side. Oh, yeah, so now they have something to leverage their own decisions. To leverage, whereas in peacetime, okay. you know, get bent. I'm not bending to you. Yeah, for you know, what? Actually, for what? I like that you bring that up because I wonder if that's, I think that's, I feel like that's maybe a development we'll see in season two of House of Dragon is that the people who choose sides 
it would be interesting to see if they do that for their own personal reasons. If they think like, oh, I'm going to side with Team Black because it'll give me this, these advantages. Or, yeah. or I'm going to side with Team Green because of, like, it seems like they'll care less about like, oh, what implications does this have on the realm? No, they don't oh, care about that. Oh, that's the last consideration. Yeah, they want to know what's going to benefit them. I mean, even Boris Baratheon admits just as much when Lucerus shows up and he's like, you know, you need to bend the knee to Rhaenyra like, you're, like your father did. And he said, um... Prince Aemon from Team Green just showed up and said he's going to marry one of my daughters. So, of course, I'm going to be Team Green. Why would I join you guys? You, you're empty-handed. You yeah, know? you're not going to offer me anything. Yeah. So, and so all these yeah. offers really um, hollow out the power of uh, both Matilda and Stephen. Absolutely. Um, and so, and that's what, that's what the real, like, the, the, England is just exhausted by the end of this war. And most medieval wars are dumb, <laughs> but they're usually quick. And the damage, we're so impacted from World War One and World War Two, and also nuclear, the threat of nuclear war. Mm-hmm. We kind of equate war with just absolute destruction. Mm-hmm. Whereas in pre-modern times, there simply wasn't the technology yeah. to do that. It's a few thousand guys... And they're causing havoc where they are. Mm -hmm. But if you're a few villages down, you might not even know. You might not even really care unless that change in rulership would affect you personally. Except the anarchy is an exception. Okay. Where it's because it's so decentralized, it's so lawless that no one's really safe. Mm. And that, you know, you have to start like bringing weapons as you farm. Okay. And stuff like that. So another kind of a parallel would be like in the Mexican Revolution. Mm-hmm. Of how that's really a breakdown of law and order, and how you just have these interminable struggles between these factions that don't really resolve. Yeah, just keep going and going. Mm-hmm. Um, but going back, uh, let's talk a bit about Matilda mm-hmm. because she's a very fr- and you know she's the one I know least about. But I got some books recently. Nice. Uh, if I had more time, I would totally delve into them. But um, <laughs> Matilda. Um, she, she is very unlikable (laughs) and that a lot of the people who side with her at first are just upset with Steven. Mm. They, they're not like big Matilda fans. Yeah. And, um, this kind of goes into the frustration of the war and, but it also shows some of her character. Um, so at the battle of Lincoln, Steven gets kidnapped. He gets captured by Matilda's side. Oh, okay. And um, Matilda is uh, ecstatic about this. She goes to London and is proclaimed the Lady of the English, Hmm. which is another of her names. But she puts such a tax on the Londoners to pay for her war that the Londoners riot. And she has to escape the city. Bad luck for her. Yeah, and, and then... What happens is that Robert Gloucester, um, you know, who is her strong right hand, he gets kidnapped by the other side. Oh, no. So now there has to be a prisoner exchange. <laughs> and so the war, the war just keeps going on. And then, late, you know, interminable years later, uh, Matilda is trapped in a siege by uh, Stephen. Okay. And it's really do or die. Um, and they send messages to, uh, Jeffrey, her husband, and they did not like each other. And so he said, no, <laughs> I'm not coming to rescue you. I'm too busy in Normandy being awesome oh, God. and just conquering everything. Um, you know, I'll send you Henry, my son, uh, my little boy. He did not want to save his own wife. No, oh, my. you know, um, but she was very difficult, hmm. very haughty. And, you know, at eight years old, she's shipped off to be to Germany. Totally different culture. Yeah. Um, and raised in absolute luxury. Yeah. Even more than the English kings and the French kings, you know. Mm-hmm. They're so like, of course she's going to be like a spoiled brat. Like, and she's the empress. Yeah. What, once you're called the empress, it's like giving, getting an Emmy or a Nobel Prize. <laughs> your, your head will never be shrunken again. Mm-hmm. You know, um... And so there's this amazing moment, though, um, where, so she's trapped in this castle, and she decides to sneak past her guards, sneak past the guards watching the castle, and to escape 
Mm. And she's wearing a white cloak during winter. Mm. So she's camouflaged on the snow. Oh. And it's in the dead of night. Wow. And she goes like eight miles oh. to friends. That's a long way to go. In, mm-hmm. in and she's night. like in her 30s or 40s. Wow. Yeah. And so um, that that also just shows the topsy-turvy nature of this war and that it's never going to end. Yeah, I mean, 18 years, that's a very, very long time. That's a very time. long time. You know, that's from birth to being able to vote. Yeah, that just this war you is know, happening. That's crazy. This war is going on. And jumping back to Stephen, I want to give an example of how he's a bit too nice, mm-hmm. which is great for us. Because we like, I like nice guys. Yeah. But bad for him. And he was criticized for this stuff. Mm-hmm. So, for example, uh, one thing that was done to ensure um, loyalty was to take captives, mm-hmm. hostages. So, give me your son, and I'm, sh- I'm going to totally treat him nice, unless <laughs> you, uh, you, you piss me off. Yeah. And this was a normal practice. Mm-hmm. Totally normal. And, um, so, uh, William Marshall is a seven-year-old boy, and he's given over to, uh, Stephen, and then his father, John Fitzgilbert, rebels, because that's, John did that all the time, Mm -hmm. and he rebels and is besieged by King Stephen, and the king threatens to kill William by attaching him to a catapult and launching him at the walls. Oh my god. To kill him. That's brutal. That's brutal. Um, and John is still defiant in saying, I still have the hammer and the anvil with which to forge still more and better sons. Oh. So, ball's in your court, Stephen. Oh. (laughs) But Stephen doesn't have the heart to kill the little boy. Thank God. I mean. Um, and now as a contrast, a generation later, you have King John of Robin Hood fame. And he's in the same situation with these Welsh princes princes mm-hmm. and Welsh Welsh guys just live to revolt that's just what they do on Sundays <laughs> um and uh King John went ahead and killed 28 hostages wow. all boys ranging from ages 12 to 14 wow all very young yeah but that's the difference and Stephen was not willing to be that cruel mm. I mean that's very Viserys right I mean Viserys threatens several times that he's gonna like oh I'll cut out your tongue or I'll oh, yeah. take your eyes if you talk bad about Rainier but he never actually does it Damon does though Damon, Damon the yeah. second Damon you know said anything said that Rainier's kids were bastards Damon had no problem killing him so Damon was like that side of the coin but yeah Viserys I would say would, was also the kind of too nice like I'm not gonna act because I'm I have a I have a good conscience, you know. Yeah, and it it's very kind of Eddard Stark, mm. where he, you know, he goes to Cersei and he's like, um, "I'll let you live." Yeah. Basically, and Cersei's like, "Ha ha!" Like, you're yeah, not. it's like you're. He's he's totally out of his mind. Yeah. Because he's he's thinking with his heart. Absolutely. And he's thinking, well, if I was Cersei. And he's like, no, no, you're not Cersei. Yeah, like, Cersei so, has no problem being cruel, unlike you, Ned. Like. Yeah. Um, and so, and George R. R. Martin uh, has also talked about the death of Joffrey was inspired partly by the death of Eustace, hmm. King Stephen's son. Interesting. Okay. Uh, King uh, Eustace was at a feast and choked to death on his food. Hmm. It was declared an accident, but suspicion still remained because it was very convenient. Mm. In order to let the anarchy finally end. So they think he might have been poisoned, like Joffrey. Yeah. Mm, okay. Um, Interesting. So... Let me see here. So another interesting thing about this war um, is that both sides were led by powerful women. Okay. Because when Stephen got um, kidnapped, the person running his faction... Was his wife Matilda? Mm-hmm. So we have now we have two Matildas. Wait, there were two different Matildas. There are two different. Okay, Matildas. so we have Empress Matilda, and then Stephen had a wife also named Matilda. Yes. Okay. Oh Which my God. is another departure from Game of Thrones <laughs> is that George Martin is not cruel enough <laughs> to give have everyone name the same thing. I mean, we already have Rhaenyra, Rhaenys, Raina. Yeah. Everyone already has the same name. So. Yeah. Um, and Stephen's wife was pretty formidable and like bolstered her husband's claims. So. 
in such a sexist world, we get these two women, much like in Game of Thrones, mm-hmm. or I should say House of the Dragon, where both sides are led by women. Yeah. Alicent on one side and Rhaenyra on the other. Yeah, and um, so that's another interesting parallel. And then the other parallel is that the war was uh, multi-generational. Mm. So it was set up, the, the war was set up by Henry I. Yeah. It's fought by uh, Matilda and Stephen. Uh, and then it's finally finished off by their children, Eustace and Henry. Mm. So in the same way we have like, it's set up by Viserys. Mm-hmm. Uh, then it's being fought by Alicent and Rhaenyra. And then it's being passed on. To their children. To their children who are now embroiled mm-hmm. in this conflict that isn't theirs. That's true. They were just, they inherited it. They inherited almost. it. Yeah. You know, uh, so that's the other thing. And how, and very briefly, I'll mention how the war ends. Mm-hmm. So it ends because Henry, who is the son of Matilda and Geoffrey, Mm-hmm. Finally grows up. He's like 18. Mm-hmm. Um, and he decides, I'm actually going to finally get an army and conquer England my birthright. All right. And he shows up and he does some damage to these towns or whatever, but he quickly realizes that England is exhausted. No one wants to fight. Yeah. And um, so then he changes tactics. He sends his mercenaries away and he starts a diplomatic campaign of peace and reconciliation and working things through. And Stephen brought his army to crush this bug. Yeah. But his side didn't want to fight either. Okay. And so they, he had to retreat. Mm. And um, what finally happened is that they decided to have a peace where Henry would be declared uh, Stephen's heir. Mm-hmm. So Stephen dies and it goes to Henry. Okay. Did Stephen ever have any children? Yes, he had uh, Eustace, mm. who, who uh, you know, dies by food. Yeah. So I was going to say, dies, Eustace... And Eustace was very upset, as you can imagine. Yeah, I would think Eustace wouldn't be okay with this agreement at yeah, all. Yeah, and um, he has a big tiff with his dad, Stephen. And Stephen, at this point, is in his 60s. Wow. That's how long this battle's been going on a long time. This has been going on. And uh and so then just very conveniently, uh, Eustace dies. So uh yeah. I I want I've not researched this at all, but I wonder if it was even Stephen that killed him. Oh, interesting. To make peace. That would make sense because if they just wanted the war to end and you know they make this this deal that basically disinherits Eustace, yeah, that that could lead to a whole nother war, a whole nother rebellion where Eustace, you know, gathers his supporters and that's exactly yeah, it makes sense that Stephen would be like, I wanna kinda crush this rebellion. Which this not to get too off topic, but that's actually kind of an interesting theory about Game of Thrones that some people believe Tywin either was part of the Purple Wedding oh. or that he knew that it was happening and allowed it to happen. Because I think it's clear Tywin didn't like Joffrey. I think he saw that Joffrey would be, like, you know, a warmonger and, like, would be hard to control. And I think he, just like Olena, saw that Tommen would be an easier king to control. So they wanted, so he let Joffrey die in order mm-hmm. to have Tommen rule, which I, I like that theory because I think it would make sense for Tywin to do that. Same way that it's possible Stephen ordered or was a part of Eustace's death. So. Yeah, which I, mm-hmm. I'm not basing on anything. Mm-hmm. I'm just totally speculating yeah elena is actually a good example a good archetype for matilda actually Mm -hmm. and that she's a very impressive august woman but also has you know some air she has she's thorny yeah the queen of thorns the queen of thorns and so um just imagine queen of thorns in her 30s and 40s Mm -hmm. interesting she might act um and then what happens is that within the year of this agreement uh, Stephen dies. Oh, wow. And so Henry this, Henry is now proclaimed Henry II, and then now we're into the Plantagenets. There we go, yeah. And Henry would have his sons, um, who were Richard the Lionheart and King John. There we go. Mm-hmm. So things are, you know, move, moving on. But that's uh, the anarchy. That's fascinating. I have some more stuff, but um, this is more brief. But do you have any questions? No, I mean, I think I think this is a really fascinating conflict. I can see a lot of the parallels between this and House of the Dragon. 
And, you know, from this, from the way this ends, I mean, I think this could lead us to speculate what could happen in House of the Dragon, you know? Um, yeah, I even, I, I, mm. I know I, sh- I probably should research, like, read up on all this stuff, mm. but I kind of don't. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't really want to, like, there's a reason, yeah, I'm not, I don't want to read Fire and Blood until House of the Dragon's over, like, I don't want to spoil myself, but, I mean, of course I speculate that there will be some similarities, like, we've already seen, but, like, I, I kind of doubt that it's going to end with just this diplomatic agreement because Aegon the Second, you know, who's on the throne, does not seem like this kind of diplomatic guy. I think he's going to sign on to Otto's violent, let's kill Rhaenyra. Like, I think he's yeah. going to want to just, I think he'll become kind of almost like a Joffrey-esque character. Be like, this is mm-hmm. my throne now. Like, I'm keeping it. I don't know. Like, well, and the difference is, is that uh, Game of Th- in House of Dragon is much more personal than mm-hmm. the history. Yeah. The Tell and Steven probably knew each other because mm-hmm. they are cousins. Yeah. But there there isn't this family animosity. Yeah. There's even a great story where uh, Henry II, when he was 13, decides, very, you know, very much like his Han Solo father, mm-hmm. I'm going to go get an army and invade England. Mm-hmm. He's 13. Idiot. <laughs> and uh, he goes there, and immediately it's a fia- it's a total fiasco. Oh, of course. <laughs> his his mercenaries are not paid, and he's stuck. And he's writing letters to his mother and father saying, "I need money." And they're like, "No, this is your problem. Get an Uber or whatever, you know." Get an Uber. <laughs> <laughs> and so he's just stranded in England, and Stephen actually shows up and pays for the mercenaries. And pays for Henry's trip back to France. Hmm. So it's another example of Stephen being a great guy. Hmm. But and, but it was a great diplomatic coup because he's magnanimous. Mm-hmm. You know. Um, and so that's something that is a big difference too in that like the medieval world is very violent. And the show mirrors that. For sure. But there were moments of levity and moments of humanity Absolutely. Uh, within the, and also just violence is very costly yeah. and wasteful. And so real real human beings are not going to be like that. And often they don't have the technology to do that. Mm-hmm. Once you get to like Stalin and Hitler, the whims of one guy can just ruin the lives of millions. Yeah. But, you know, the king's power only goes so far. Absolutely. And I think... I think that's where the dragons play into it, too. You can see the dragons as that piece of technology where, like, one dragon rider can choose to kill however yes. many people they want to with their dragon because how do you... You can't really stop a dragon. And um, and so now the, the, the calculus is different where you go, normally I would let this these captured enemies go, but I know that they're dragon riders. Yeah. Or I know... So I have to kill them now. Mm-hmm. So it, the, the, since the stakes are so high the excuse for violence it's totally like cia Mm -hmm. where they go should we really uh overthrow guatemala really no but oh my god the nukes the cold war so of course we have to do it yeah it's that it's really twisted thinking once you have these super weapons exactly so yeah i think that will up their propensity to violence the fact that you know each side has dragons that can destroy a whole city destroy a whole family and kill thousands of people yeah i think it'll make them more quick to to violence and to kill and what i, to, I yeah. hope they show is the breakdown of law mm. where people don't know who wait whose law are we following yeah um uh that's what i really hope if the show is going to follow the anarchy the great yeah. thing about george martin is that he takes history as an inspiration mm-hmm. but then he really mixes and matches things yeah so it's not it's because the dance of the dragons is breaks the back of the Targaryens. They're never the same. Mm-hmm. Whereas the anarchy is more uh, an example of uh, the limits of royal power and mm-hmm. the the problem of decent so such decentralization, such limited government. Yeah. That it's just uh, you know chaotic. It's you know the anarchy is an apt term. Yeah, because it's like there's no there's law, no there's like, no law and there's kind of even no narrative a lot of the times. It's yeah. just like this guy kills this guy and then yeah you know it just goes on and on. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do want to talk about the another historical two more historical discussions yeah. about Damon and Rhaenyra. Yes, and how. Um, it's very much like the conspiracy theory mm. that 
King Richard III wanted to marry his niece, Elizabeth of York. Mm. Now, Shakespeare, being a Tudor propagandist, totally <laughs> took this in running mm -hmm. in uh, his play, which is amazing, by the way. Mm. I love that play. Mm -hmm. it's so when it, It's so evil. Do you want me to close the blind? Are you okay? Or um, are you yeah. I want you to be blinded. Oh, we'll close the other one instead. All right. There. I don't want you to be blinded. Well, have this conversation. So, I don't know much about the details of these characters. Yeah. But in the history, uh, Richard III is actually the last of the Plantagenets. So, we go from Henry II mm -hmm. all the centuries later to, to Richard III. Okay. He's at the very end. And um, this is like 1480s. So, in only 10, 12 years, Columbus is discovering the New World. Okay. This is the, t this is the tail end of the Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. And he kills. His brother, Edward IV, then kills his uh, uh, nephew, Edward V, oh, wow. and probably kills the, the princes in the tower. Oh, yes, the there we go. two other sons of Edward V. Mm -hmm. Which some IV. people say inspired um, Bran and Rickon being trapped in Winterfell during in oh, Game of Thrones. They yeah. say that they were the princes in the tower that disappeared. Because that's who they were. Yeah. They disappeared, too. Oh, I love that. That's great. Yeah, I've heard that connection. And so, um, Richard is having to deal with Henry Tudor, who is a Lancastrian. Okay. By the slimmest of margins. He's really just a go-getter. Mm -hmm. um, and he's worried about him coming very much like Daenerys mm -hmm. uh, and reclaiming the English throne. Mm -hmm. And so the thing that Henry Tudor will need is Elizabeth of York to make him legitimate. Mm. The marriage between them two. Okay. So uh, Richard III has uh, his wife dies, his, uh, his baby son dies in the crib. And so the rumor is put out there that he would marry Elizabeth of York. Okay. So much so that he had to publicly declare... I am in no way planning on marrying my niece. Oh, my. Now, I loved... I, I wanted to join in on the Tudor hype and believe that totally Richard would do this mm -hmm. because he's such a villain. Mm -hmm. and I love how evil he is. <laughs> but as I looked into it briefly, that's not true. Mm, so you don't think he was ever actually planning it? No, this was propaganda. Okay. But... Uh, the White Princess by Philippa Gregory, which mm. was turned into a TV show. Oh, okay. Takes, I, on, I only read part of it, but it takes the viewpoint that actually they were in love. Mm, okay. And just, there was a lot of incest going on in the Middle Ages, but even then, uh, uncle and niece is, was, was way too close. Yeah, like people were okay with like what cousins, right? Cousins and, like, and sort of... everybody was related somehow. But, but not that. Yeah. Not that. So it's very likely. It's like, who benefits from this? It really benefits Henry Tudor, who then becomes Henry VII. And Elizabeth of York is the mother of Henry VIII. Oh, okay. So that's there we a go. connection. Um, and lastly, and so this really, uh, I think, is kind of the inspiration of Damon and Rhaenyra. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know enough to speculate on what the implications are. Would be your, or whatever, because I don't know these characters as well. Yeah. Well, I have some ideas because I, there are definitely several interpretations of Damon and Rainier's relationship. Um, you know, people debate about this. Some people do believe that they're in love, the kind of the white princess esque that they, you know, got married and got together because because they love each other. Um, and I think the show does kind of encourage that us to kind of see that. But also, there's the argument that um, you know you're talking about how he, there's the conspiracy theory that he wanted to marry. Elizabeth of York to give himself legitimacy. Some mm -hmm. people think that Damon, you know, groomed and manipulated Rhaenyra so that he could marry her so that he could inherit her claim because he thought he was the heir. Oh, and so he's playing the long game. Yeah, so some people think this is his ploy to kind of rule through her and to claim the throne and be the heir that he thought he was supposed to be before Viserys named Rhaenyra. So, um, so yeah, there's a lot of debate in the fandom, I would say, over whether, you know, is this actually love? Is this, you know, a predatory, like, a this uncle groomed his young niece throughout her life? Which, I mean, there's also hints of that in the show as well. Is this a, a political maneuver, you know? There's 
So there's a lot of different interpretations. Just like with history, there's a lot of different speculations. Yeah. Of, yeah. So definitely. Mm-hmm. I'll have to talk about that choke yeah. in the last episode, which I was... That was just awkward. Mm. But I, we'll, we'll get to that. Yeah, no, maybe, I love that you bring that up because it, it, it sparked a lot of controversy in the fandom, for sure. Yeah, so, it kind of um, felt like chalk value, but mm. whatever. I, I would love to get your thoughts later. Yeah, no, so I'd love this, to talk about this that. This will be the last thing I want to talk about. Because I was thinking about, like, the historical inspirations of the Targaryens themselves. Yeah. Um, and this is not going to be as detailed, but here is kind of the layers of inspiration that I found that were really interesting. So think of these as all, like, aspects or ingredients that uh, George Martin put into the stew of his story. Because on the yeah. surface, they're pretty very much the French Normans ruling over Anglo-Saxon England. Okay. With... Uh, uh, William the Bastard gets great makeover, becomes uh, uh, William the Conqueror mm-hmm. in 1066, and he makes he bring he yanks England into a French orbit. Whereas before mm-hmm. the, the English were much more Norwegian looking, m- much more northern looking. Okay. Um, he firmly so so much of English history is meddling in French politics. Okay. And Henry Henry the Second spoke French. Richard uh, the Lionheart spoke French. He tried to sell London because he hated the city. <laughs> um, so, and you know, it's the reason why most languages don't have uh, two words for uh, an animal and the meat from the animal. Mm. They just say, "Oh, I'm having pig," or "I'm yeah. having cow." Uh, whereas we have the Anglo-Saxon word for cow, Mm -hmm. but then the French word for beef Mm. and for poultry and for uh, pork. All those are French. So that's the doubling effect Mm. uh, based on this, the fact that the English were ruled by French monarchs for centuries. Okay, Um, And it's something Tolkien hated. (laughs) (laughs) And a lot of English, once English nationalism gets in, people, oh, they hate this. Mm -hmm. So much French in my you know, daily life. English language, yeah. yeah. But I mean, that's um, why English is. English is German, it's Latin, it's, yeah, it's, it's Spanish and French. And it's, it's the ultimate mutt. It's a bunch of things. Yeah, it's everything. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and you see this too with, like, the Targaryens where their names are so distinct from the Westerosi names. Mm-hmm. Where it's Rhaenyra and Varys and mm-hmm. uh, Viserys and... Um, those names are not commonplace names. Mm-hmm. They're only for the Targaryens. Exactly. Um, which I would love to... I wish maybe in Fire and Blood they get into this, but I would love to know more about the language dynamics. Yeah. Actually, it's funny you say that because I've been taking the Duolingo course on High Valyrian, so I've been learning, oh, yeah. I've been learning High Valyrian. Very it's been good. a lot of fun. I'm at like a, what, a 28-day streak, I think. So Nice. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I like that you bring that up because I think along with the Targaryens, you know, having... Their, their language, Valyrian, and their distinct um, names. I think their appearance definitely plays a part, too, in, like, the othering of them. You know, they show yeah. up with this beautiful platinum blonde hair and these purple eyes, and they contain mm-hmm. dragons. Like, it seems like their appearance, as well as their different language, would, like, kind of set them up as, like, outsiders. Like, they're so different from the Westerosi, you know? They're seen maybe as, like, foreign others, like, invaders, you know? So I think there's and, this othering effect. And then that know? appearance leads to like confirmation biases yeah when a targaryen doesn't look like that mm, which is yeah. a big problem with rhaenyra yeah when there's brunette targaryens yeah. even though that happens all the time in, in the books but i understand how like yeah there's this perception of like if this is what targaryen is supposed to look like and they don't look like that an issue of legitimacy well, yeah, i feel like people up. wanted to pile on rhaenyra anyway so that's yeah their, their ammo yeah um but uh but and I think the show and, and the books, they he, uh, he simplifies the language. Because mm. he's not like Tolkien where he creates languages. He creates yeah. little bits and pieces. Yeah. Um, because one of the problems of trying to be historically based or trying to mimic history is history is way too complicated. <laughs> it's way too messy. It's very nuanced. So you yeah. need to, you know, um, synthesize things. So everybody just speaks the same language in Westeros. And yeah. It's like, okay, got it. Makes we, we already have too much. Uh, it was a weird transition going from Game of Thrones to House of Dragon because I read all the books mm. House of, of Game of Thrones. Mm-hmm. And House of Dragon, it was difficult for me to keep up at times. Mm. 
all the names and I'm like, man, I now feel sorry for people in season one. Yeah. Because like, there's way more names and stuff to keep track of in season one. Absolutely. It's hard to get grounded right away. I've always said that I think the best way to watch shows like this, like Game of Thrones, House of the Dragon, is to watch it with someone who's seen it before or knows the world. Because, like, I watched Game of Thrones for the first time with a, a friend of mine years ago who had seen the show many, many times. So I got to keep pausing it and be like, what? Like, explain this to me. Oh, or, nice. like, the way I watched Game of Thrones with my family it was, like, yeah, I was the one who had seen it. Now I'm answering their questions. So, yeah, I agree. I think you need someone to, like, anchor you. Because it's, it's, it can be overwhelming. Yeah. yeah. So the next uh, layer of influence I find is uh, the Ptolemaic dynasty in ancient Egypt. Interesting. So um, Egypt gets conquered by the Babylonians and is passed on to the Assyrians and the Persians It's passed on to all these people. Mm -hmm. But finally, Alexander conquers uh, the Persian Empire. And so Egypt is now in the, um, ruled by one of his generals, Ptolemy. So okay. now Egypt is fully Greek-sized, if, if I can conjugate that. Yeah. Um, it's pulled into the Greek orbit. And so pharaohs are like way in the past. Mm -hmm. And... What, so you have these Greek dynasty ruling over these native Egyptians, mm -hmm. uh, very much like the Targaryens ruling over native uh, Andals and First Men. And also, the Ptolemies were infamous for their incest. There we go. And that so they then. married within their own bloodlines. Mm. Uh, Cleopatra the Great, who is at the end of the Ptolemies, mm -hmm. actually was betrothed to her brother. Mm. And they hated each other. <laughs> Yep. And she ditched her... They were in a civil war, actually, when Julius Caesar shows up. Mm, okay. Um, and then she shacks up with Caesar and, you know... Oh. Makes sense. Because that happens with the Targaryens, too. You know, we have siblings in the Targaryen line or each other that hate each other. and Yeah, but know, also you know. the incest thing. Yeah. Um, uh, and also that kind of foreignness and that, that sense of, like, grandeur of the Valyrians. Yeah. And, that, you know, we are the house of old Valyria. Mm -hmm. And Egypt was very much, like... Even though the Greeks kind of hated the people they ruled over, they still, like Cleopatra, the good ones, uh, who are not, you know, closed-minded idiots, <laughs> were in, took that as their heritage of, like, mm -hmm. I am in the line of the pharaohs, basically. Yeah. And looking at the pyramids and just this grandeur that was lost Absolutely. and that's remaining. Absolutely. So all these, like, uh, hints and the Valyrian steel and the roads and... Essos and stuff like mm -hmm. that. All these, you know, um, all these great little, you know, remnants, residue. Yeah, I think we see that with Daenerys too, because I think it's so interesting that even though she grows up in Essos, you know, because she escaped from Westeros as a baby and everything, she sees Westeros as her home. She sees yeah. the Iron Throne as her rightful place, even though... She's never seen it. Yeah, she's never seen it. She's not from there. Her, her family's actually from Valyria, right? Which, I mean, Valyria's not there anymore. But yeah, it's interesting that, yeah, she feels that that place is home, even though in reality it, it kind of is a foreign place to her. She's never yeah. been there. She's not... Her family isn't from there. It's, you know, she didn't grow up uh, there. Yeah. On a mythological level, I think uh, Martin is taking a lot of his prince... In influence also from the Trojan survivors of the Trojan War, oh. who go on to found Rome. Mm. Of course, none of that's true, but it makes <laughs> for a great story. It's better than yeah, we were sheep herders and then we yeah. built a city um, <laughs> in and, a day. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah, <laughs> um, and so uh, very much like the the destruction of Troy and the mythology that has and the yeah. doom of Valyria. And um, is was Viserys making Valyria? Yes, in he was his, building it. In mm -hmm. his uh, office? He was, yeah. Uh, yeah, and so that's definitely a lot of influence, too. And then the last influence I'll talk about is actually the, the Umayyad Caliphate in Spain. Okay. So, very, very brief. Uh, the Umayyads are the second caliphate, and they did a lot of great things, but they're also, uh, they got involved in Arab chauvinism. Okay. And it was this belief that only the Arabs could understand and appreciate the Quran and Muhammad. Mm. And then all the okay. new mu Muslims, you know, step back. Oh, okay. And okay. this was, you know, the second caliphate. So Islam was still kind of new. Mm. It was still in its growing pains. And then they only lasted 90 years when they got overthrown by the Abbasids. Mm. But, and the, you know, the Abbasids, as you do, you kill off all the Umayyads. So you don't have endless you know, anarchies and in, in wars, yeah. but one member survived and he goes off 
to North Africa and then crosses the Strait of Gibraltar and conquers southern Spain. Wow, it's like Daenerys. It's right? like Daenerys, where it's like the Targaryens were this one surviving branch of this huge power uh, goes off and founds uh, the Umayyads in Spain. Mm. And, Cord- and, you know, Cordoba is his capital. Uh, and the Umayyads in, Sp- in uh, Spain actually start to rival um, the rest of the Muslim world. And uh, it's like kind of the heart of the Islamic Golden Age. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, so that's a pretty interesting. And it, from what I've read, it would be a pretty great place to live at its height. Mm. Like, it was very tolerant of different religions, uh, because they had to be. Yeah. Um, they're, they're upstarts, of course. They have, they have mm-hmm. to be tolerant. But yeah. that's great for the people living there. Absolutely. And it was a time of innovation and poetry and art and wow. all this, you know, great stuff. Uh, eventually crashes and burns like everything else. Yeah. But, um, so that's definitely, I think, is the last layer I think he's drawing inspiration from is, like, the last branch. Because they, I believe the Valerians were not big players. Or the Targaryens, I mean, sorry. Yeah, the from, Targaryens yeah, were not from, big players. Yeah, from what I understand, they were a pretty minor family in Valeria, but because they survived and then, you know, came to Westeros with dragons, then they were able to, you know become conquerors and take over. I'd love to know if they were thought of as hicks. Because they followed their daughter's prophecy and go to Dragonstone. I I wonder if they were like, you people are crazy. You're you're getting up and leaving. You guys are like doomsday preppers. Yeah. weird. That would be kind of interesting to see. I would love to see a show. Like, if there wasn't a spinoff series, I would love to see an old Valyria spinoff series where the Targaryens are, like, not even important. They're just like, who? The Tarwoodians? Like, yeah. and we see the guys who are actually the big players in Yeah, Valyria. they just go, oh, gross. You know, the Targaryens. Yeah. Which is interesting, because then it turns the Targaryens into kind of an underdog story, you know? The guys who started off as a minor house because of this horrible doom, you know, and coming to this new place, then they were able to become kings, and, mm-hmm. you know. It's an interesting turn of events. So, so yeah, that's, wow. that's all I got. That's awesome. Ryan, thank you. I love picking your brain and hearing all these all these things and, you know, learning something new about medieval history. It's really fascinating to see. I had no idea George R. R. Martin had so many different influences, it sounds like, from so many different cultures around the world, too. Yeah, and that's something that's uh, good to see, that he isn't just writing Wars of the Roses and changing the names. Yeah. Doing a control F, re- mm-hmm. find and replace. Yeah. Um, which he's talked about. He's talked about that temptation to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, which is why he put in dragons. I, he was talking to his niece or his cousin, and he was like, oh, should I put in dragons? She's like, oh, totally, put in dragons. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, um, make it your own. Yeah. Make it your own. And I think also Game of Thrones is a great gateway into medieval history. And... Uh, what's great about Midi because it's so gossipy and so high school, mm-hmm. you start to really like, as you become more of a nerd of medieval history, mm-hmm. you start to pick up on all the details of like, oh, that that guy did this in this other period, you know? Yeah, which I think that's what turns it into a really compelling story, a great book series, a great television show. Is that because it has that? that gossip and that drama and that those political motives that fuel conflict like i think that makes for really compelling television you know yeah um mm. yeah and it, it's kind of it's a type of storytelling that um is not seen a lot mm-hmm. of, of of given little hints of backstory yeah uh more and more and um I'm really excited for where season two is going. Mm-hmm, me too. Um, season one has a lot of growing pains, a lot of kind of awkward teenage moments, mm-hmm. if you want to stretch out the analogy. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the thing that I like the most uh, compared to other shows that have been coming out this year is that people talk about the characters. Absolutely. One of the biggest problems I saw with Rings of Power from even its fans, is that how quickly people moved off the topic of the characters. Yeah. They talked about the mystery boxes of who's Sauron, who is this Gandalf. When They're not talking about the characters. They're talking about the mechanics of the show and the mm-hmm. kind of the hype train of the that, show. Yeah, I think that's a bad sign. And mm-hmm. that, I always, something I try to do when I kind of observe fandoms is I notice what are they talking about. Mm-hmm. 
And when the fandom is talking about Damon and Vasaris and these personal relationships, I think that's good. Oh yeah, that's all they're talking about really yeah. is, the, is the personal relationships, which I think, which I think is the heart and soul of the story. Yeah. But and so we, we're, yeah, and we're we're kind of escaping the prequel problem of like, oh, that's that's baby Ned Stark. Or, yeah. Oh my God, that's. Yeah, you know, Tywin as a, you know... Yeah, uh, teenager. Teenager. Really. Which, yeah, that's one thing I like about this prequel series taking place so far in the past. For one, I think it makes this show a great in for people into the world of A Song of Ice and Fire. Like, I know some people who've never watched Game of Thrones or anything, but they're watching House of the Dragon because it's its own story and it's, like, your own in into the world, you know? And you don't have to have seen Game of Thrones to understand House of Dragon because they're their own stories because they take place so far apart. So I like that, that they can kind of stand alone and, like... Of course, there's relationships between the two, like with the dagger and with Aegon's prophecy, um, which I, I do. I like those connections, but I like at the same time that they, they stand alone. They have their own identities, their own shows. Mm-hmm. I like that a lot. Hmm. Yeah. There is a danger of reading too much of the history behind Game of Thrones mm. in that sometimes the real history is more interesting, mm. especially in the later books of Game of Thrones mm. and the later seasons mm. of Game of Thrones. Hopefully that does not happen with House of the Dragon. Yeah. But, um, uh, yeah, definitely uh, medieval history can become a complete rabbit hole. Mm-hmm. And can tell. That's what I've been taking. I took a break from medieval history for a good two years. Mm-hmm. And then... Preparing to do this podcast totally ringed me back in. <laughs> well, good. I'm glad we got to strike anew your your love of it. Um, but it's during, yeah. like, we're almost in finals week, and it's ruining my life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I hope this is a nice break from final. That, yes. That's what this is like for me, too. I mean, this is part of my final. You know, this is part of my class. Um, but this was a lot of fun. I'm really glad I got to talk to you about mm-hmm. this. Was there anything else you, uh, you want to talk about? Or? No, that's it. All right. Oh, cool. Well, thank you so much, Ryan, and thank you guys so, for joining yes. me today. Uh, and I hope you all have a great rest of your day.